Namo tassa bagavato arahato sama sambutasa, Namo tassa bagavato arahato sama sambutasa, Namo tassa bagavato arahato sama sambutasa, Budhang tamang sangang namasami. So, continuing with the theme of samadhi. <coughs> So at this point, we've had one full day of retreat. Is that it? Two full days. Is that right? OK, two full days of retreat. Um, so hope, hopefully, at this point, uh, <coughs> your mind is starting to settle down a little bit. Um, is that true of anybody? Mind settling down a little bit? A little bit? I see some, some hands, some wavering hands. Um, so this is a good sign. Uh, generally speaking, no matter how bad things seem to be at the beginning of a retreat, uh, if we just stick with it, we keep following the schedule and the guidelines, uh, then even if we think that the meditation is not going very well, it tends to get better. Uh, the mind starts to, to settle out starts to become a bit more stable, a bit more even, uh, a bit more collected. Uh, and some of that is just the nature of the retreat environment. Uh, so often, uh, especially when people are new to retreats, um, but even sometimes after uh, people have been going on retreats and spending time in monasteries for years, sometimes it still comes up that uh, they come to the retreat and they see this, the guidelines and they're like, I don't want to follow these rules. These rules are stupid. These rules don't apply to me. Uh, or they look at the schedule and they're like, okay, I like that. I like that. I don't like that. I think I'll try to skip this and hope nobody notices. Uh, this, uh, so th this kind of half-hearted approach to the schedule and guidelines. Uh, and that's really missing missing something incredibly valuable. Uh, so the schedule and the guidelines are, are not arbitrary. Uh, they're actually directly meant to support the meditation practice. Uh, they're meant to create the conditions which make it much easier uh, to dive deeply into the meditation practice. Uh, so really taking the schedule and the guidelines seriously uh, so not seriously in the sense of arbitrary rules imposed by tablecloth-clad authority figures, um, but rather uh, taking the, rule, the, the schedule and the guidelines as uh, practices which we are taking on for the support of our meditation. Practices which we take on because they benefit the development of our mind. So we've all chosen to be here voluntarily. Uh, nobody was forced into this. Was anybody forced into this? No? Okay, so we're all here of our own free will. Uh, and we've chosen to be here because on some level we think that this is going to be a good thing. Uh, we have some belief that this is going to benefit us or benefit others or benefit both ourselves and others. And that's why we're here. Uh, and we've voluntarily chosen to be here to follow this schedule and these guidelines because that's part of what we believe is going to benefit us. It's part of what we believe is going to help us in the development of our hearts. Uh, so even when it seems like the meditation practice is not going well, maybe we think that we're really bad meditators, maybe we think that we just don't have what it takes, maybe we think we're doomed for this lifetime and maybe the next couple dozen lifetimes as well. Um, maybe that's true, might be might not be. Maybe that's true. Uh, in that case, don't worry so much. Don't worry so much if the meditation technique is, is failing for you. Don't worry so much if the meditation methods don't seem to be getting you anywhere. Don't worry about it so much if it seems like no matter what you do in the meditation hall, it's not working. If you just keep following the schedule and following the guidelines, things get better something starts to shift in the mind. A quality of awareness, gentleness, collectedness, stability starts to develop in the mind just by following the schedule and guidelines. 
Even if you just sit in the meditation hall and space out through every single meditation period, if you just keep following the schedule and guidelines, eventually your mind starts to become more clear, start to become a bit more attentive, a bit more steady. Now, I'm not recommending that. I'm not recommending spacing out. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, what I'm emphasizing is that the schedule and the guidelines themselves are conducive to the arising of samadhi and for the development of wisdom. Um, so really look, look at that. Look at the schedule, look at the guidelines, uh, and make that commitment. Uh, and as I mentioned last night, you've all been doing a pretty good job so far. Pretty good job with the schedule and the guidelines, which is quite wonderful. I've been on some retreats where half the people clearly did not care the slightest bit what the rules were. I've been on other retreats where you go in the meditation hall and you're just like, where is everyone? Isn't there like 30 people? Why do I only see five? Uh, so, so far, like everyone's been in the hall for the meditation periods. Uh, I haven't encountered too egregious of, of rule breaking. Minor things here and there, but nothing really ser serious. Uh, so it seems like, for the most part, uh, we're all quite, uh, quite genuine uh, about our practice of following the schedule and guidelines. And that's really good. So uh, keep it up. It's really helpful. Uh, for the samadhi practice itself, um, so I've given a number of methods. Uh, I've also uh, already spoken with several people. So I've had the one-on-one -on -one consultations with a number of people talking about your practice, and it seems like uh, at least the people I've spoken to already have some idea of what, what to do, what might be helpful, some things to try, uh, things to experiment with. Uh, and, and so I'd really like to encourage, uh, again, everyone here to experiment and see what happens. Uh, so the development of our meditation practice is not necessarily about blindly applying a technique in a cookie-cutter way. But rather, our meditation practice is about trying things out and seeing what happens, and being really honest with ourselves about what's working and what's not working so well. Being really honest with ourselves about what we might consider changing. Uh, so um, again, a few things I would like to emphasize. Uh, one is that um, if your body disappears at this point in the meditation practice, that's probably not a good sign. Um, so in advanced stages of certain meditation methods, sometimes the body disappears. Most of us are probably nowhere near that right now. So that'll come out when I meet with people one-on-one. -on -one. That'll come out what exactly is going on. But generally speaking, at this point in a retreat, not a good sign. Usually at this point, that would be the sign that one's mindfulness has become very weak. Um, that one is losing awareness of the physical world, uh, which is not a sign of developing samadhi. It's a sign of weakening sati, so weakening mindfulness. Uh, so this can be quite confusing because it can seem like the mind is getting more peaceful, um, but actually we're just cutting out part of our experience. So there's less going on because we're paying attention to less things. But that's not the same as samadhi. Uh, that's just not paying attention. It's actually quite similar to falling asleep. Uh, so the development of samadhi is not a narrowing of attention. It's not a narrowing of mindfulness. Uh, it's actually the opposite. It's an extreme sharpening of awareness coupled with stability of mind, coupled with internal peacefulness and serenity. Uh, so, an indication that your samadhi improving is actually the opposite of your body disappearing. It's your body becoming extremely intense. It's the experience of the body becoming extremely strong and clear. That is a much better indication that your samadhi is improving. Uh, so, I would really encourage you to watch what's going on. Uh, if during the course of whatever you're doing in your meditation practice, if during the course of whatever you're doing, your awareness of your body starts to diminish and fade away, probably not a good sign.
But if the course of your meditation practice, your awareness of your body becomes very sharp and clear, that is a good sign. That's a sign that you might be moving in the right direction. And so today I'd like to start talking a little bit about the characteristics of jhana itself. Uh, so jhana is fully developed samadhi. Uh, so as I've mentioned a number of times, uh, we have some amount of samadhi pretty much all the time. Uh, anytime you can string two thoughts together, you've got some samadhi. Anytime you can pay attention to the same thing for more than a fraction of a second, you've got some samadhi. But most of the time our samadhi is quite weak. Okay, we're talking about 1%. As we cultivate our, our meditation practice, our samadhi grows. Maybe it goes up to 2%, 3%, 5%. Uh, when we start getting into jhana states, uh, we're dealing with much higher percentages of samadhi. Uh, and by the time one reaches fourth jhana, you've got what we might call 100% samadhi. The mind is completely undistracted, completely awake, completely stable, without the slightest trace of wavering. So ordinary everyday experience, 1% samadhi. Fourth jhana, 100% samadhi. Uh, so I'm, I'm hesitant to put exact numbers on first, second, and third jhana, <laughs> because I would just be making up numbers on the spot. Uh, but we might say that first jhana is at least 50%, probably closer to 75%, 80%. Uh, when the mind is extremely stable. Um, so the characteristics of first jhana uh, can be a way of helping us get some sense as to how to develop our samadhi practice. Um, because it gives us some idea of what we're aiming at. Um, so later on, probably tomorrow, uh, I'll go into more detail about some of the uh, less well-known lists of jhana factors, some less, no less well-known lists of characteristics of jhana. But for now, I'll focus on the five most well-known ones. Um, so the five main characteristics of first jhana are vitaka, vichara, piti, sukha, and ekagata. Does everybody know this list? Does anybody know this list? A handful of people? Okay. Uh, and different teachers explain these five factors in, in slightly different ways. Um, as every meditation teacher, to some extent, is going on their own experience. Uh, so broadly speaking, whenever we talk about Dhamma, we're talking about usually from three sources. Um, so speaking just from my own perspective, I usually speak from three sources. Um, so my personal experience, what have I gone through in my meditation experiences? Two, what have I learned from my teachers? Uh, and three, what have I learned from the suttas? Um, and in my own case, generally speaking, I will only say that something is categorically true if it matches all three of those categories. Uh, if it matches two out of three, then I'll say that this is probably true. It's almost certainly true, but I can't be completely certain. And if it's only one out of those three, then I'll generally be quite honest that this is something I've read about in the suttas, but I haven't experienced myself, and my teachers haven't talked about it. I might mention that. Or I might say this is something that my teacher has spoken about, but I didn't see it anywhere in the suttas, and I haven't experienced it myself. Um, but usually I just won't talk about those things. Uh, so when talking about uh, the factors of, of jhana, uh, again, as mentioned, any particular teacher is always talking about their own experience combined with what they've learned from their teachers and from the texts, from the, the discourses of the Buddha. So these five characteristics, um, from my perspective, uh, first off, vitaka and vichara. Uh, this is where there's the most debate around the meaning of these five terms. Uh, vitaka literally means thought, it means thinking. Uh, and vichara uh, means wandering. Uh, that's its literal meaning, it means wandering. Uh, and we see both of these words used in those meanings all throughout the suttas, uh, in all kinds of different contexts. So when you're thinking about something, then that's called vitaka. So if right now you started thinking about 
what you did last week, that's vitaka. Uh, vichara is wandering. Uh, and that's usually used in a physical sense, like if you started wandering around the neighborhood, that would be vichara. Um, it's also sometimes used in the sense of examining something. For example, if you started examining the stains in the carpet, that would be vichara. Uh, so how does this apply to jhana? Um, so my understanding uh, of first jhana is that in first jhana, there's still a certain amount of background noise in the mind. It's not mental activity that you're consciously, intentionally engaging in. Rather, it's echoes of past activity. So echoes which have not yet fully died out. So all of your intentional mind is focused on the meditation practice, but there's still some echoes of past mental activity floating around in the mind. Uh, so one way of, of taking vitaka and vichara here, uh, which I've been toying with lately as a possible way of translating these terms, is uh, vitaka as verbal thinking, vichara as nonverbal thinking. So verbal movements of mind, nonverbal movements of mind. So you can get into deep states of samadhi, where you're sitting there in meditation, and a thought just kind of randomly floats through the mind, but it doesn't distract you at all. You're not the least bit interested in that thought, and you don't engage with that thought at all. You don't even react to it. It just passes through the mind without leaving a single mark, just like a bird flying through the sky without leaving a trail in the sky, without leaving a trace. So the thought just floats through your mind, but it doesn't affect you the slightest bit. You don't react to it. You don't engage with it. You don't latch onto it. You don't push it away. It just floats through without making a mark. So you're still fully engaged with the meditation. And occasionally, a little bit of, of, of noise floats through the mind. Uh, sometimes it's verbal in the form of words or ideas. Sometimes it's nonverbal in the form of images or feelings. Uh, but either way, it doesn't affect your stability of mind. Uh, and the tuck and vichara are the first thing that, that fades away as one gets deeper into jhana. So with second jhana, the tuck and vichara fade entirely. So starting at second jhana, there's no background noise in the mind at all. Uh, but with first jhana, there's still some background noise. Uh, and Vitaka and Vichara, in one of the post-canonical texts, are referred to as the enemy of first jhana. In the sense that if you turn your attention towards those thoughts floating through your head, you will fall out of first jhana. Um, so we want to be really careful uh, not to get the least bit interested in the noise that floats through our mind. Uh, we're not trying to crush it or destroy it or silence it. We're just not interested. Because trying to crush the thoughts, trying to silence the thoughts, is just another way of reacting to the thoughts, which means we're still under their control. It means our mind is not yet stable. It means our samadhi is still weak. Uh, so instead, we're just not reacting to them in any way, not getting involved. So that's vitaka and vichara. Uh, the third and fourth qualities are piti, uh, which I translate as euphoria or ecstasy. Uh, and the fourth one, uh, sukha, uh, is happiness, uh, sometimes translated as, as pleasure. Um, so piti is this extremely intense, pleasurable sensation that saturates the entire body. Uh, so this is uh, possibly the single most distinctive characteristic of first jhana. It's absolutely unmistakable. Uh, so as, and, and sometimes it comes up before you actually enter jhana. Sometimes it comes up just in the course of doing your meditation practice. You'll, your body starts to feel good. And usually it starts quite subtle. Like you're just sitting there and you, you notice like, oh, my body's kind of comfortable, it feels kind of nice. Uh, and as you keep doing your meditation practice, that feeling keeps building and building and building uh, until it feels like your whole body is just radiating pure pleasure. 
your whole body just feels amazingly good, better than you've ever felt before, unless you've been practicing a lot of samadhi in the past somewhere. Um, so this is better than any ordinary kind of sensual pleasure. So it resembles sensual pleasure. It resembles the kind of pleasure that you can get from chemicals and sexual activity and so on. It's similar. But it's far, far more sublime, far more pleasant. It's in a completely different category. Uh, so this is quite distinct. Um, if this euphoria does not appear, odds are extremely good that you're not in first jhana or anywhere near first jhana. And that's okay. Um, but it's, it's important to keep in mind, this is one of the really distinctive signposts um, that your samadhi is starting to enter uh, jhana level samadhi, that you're starting to get into really genuine immersion uh, in the samadhi practice. Uh, and this quality of sukha, uh, so there's this very peaceful, serene bliss in the mind. So sukha is sometimes translated bliss. Uh, in when talking about jhana. Uh, so sukha is this, uh, again, it's this very peaceful, serene, happy state of mind. Um, again, it's not the agitated kind of happiness of getting something you like and trying to hold on to something you like, but it's the very serene happiness of not needing anything outside yourself. It's a very peaceful, blissful state of knowing that you don't need anything else that this moment, just as it is, is perfectly fine. Everything is okay right now. So when we recognize that everything is perfectly wonderful right in this moment, then naturally the mind becomes very, uh, very joyful, very blissful. So sukha is sometimes translated as joy uh, as well. Uh, so one way of, of thinking about this, uh, and, and it's not quite accurate, but we can, we can use it as a working model, uh, is that PT is the physical pleasure, so this physical euphoria, and sukha is the mental pleasure. And the reason I say it's not quite accurate is because as your meditation practice develops, and especially as your samadhi gets strong, the distinction between mind and body becomes irrelevant. It just drops away. It's just not something that, that applies anymore. Uh, but one way of thinking about it is that uh, PT is more of a physical experience of euphoria, uh, physical experience of, of um, ecstasy, euphoria, and sukha is more the mental experience of, of happiness and serene bliss. Uh, and the fifth distinctive quality of first jhana, and this is a, a quality I've been speaking about since day one, um, is ekagata, uh, or Sometimes you'll see it in a slightly longer form, chitte kagata or chittase kagata. Um, these all mean the same thing. It means mental unification, mental oneness, oneness of mind. So the mind is only engaged in one thing. The mind is not scattered or dispersed at all. The mind is not going in different directions. It's not trying to multitask. It's not trying to do multiple things. The mind is either completely inactive and that is not doing anything at all. Uh, or it's engaged in a single activity, such as focusing on your body, uh, focusing on a feeling. Uh, it's engaged in a single, uh, single attention. So those are the five main factors of jhana. Uh, and the ones that I'd like to highlight here, uh, first off, uh, piti. So this quality of, of euphoria or ecstasy uh, that comes up. Um, so one of the ways that we can accelerate our samadhi is while we're doing our meditation practice, when the mind starts to settle down a little bit, we start to get a little bit of just like ordinary samadhi. Uh, so maybe our samadhi is up to 5% or so. Turn attention to your body and look to see. Is there any kind of euphoria in the body. It's kind of like warm, pleasurable, uh, tingling isn't quite the right word for it. Uh, and warm isn't quite the right word for it either. 
Um, but this you know, like warm, pleasant, tingling sensation all through the body. Like this uh, just subtle, delicious, pleasant feeling in the body, even a little bit. So just take a moment just to look at your body. Can anyone feel something like this? Like a subtle, pleasant euphoria in the body? Not necessarily very strong, but just some kind of warm, tingling, pleasantness in the body. I see some nodding heads, a few people. Okay. Well, one way that we can supercharge our samadhi to speed things up a bit is to bring attention to that euphoria and allow it to grow. Magnify it. Make it brighter and stronger. And if you focus on that, um, then that can bring the mind into very strong samadhi in a very short period of time. Uh, that can bring you all the way into first jhana. So this is using the intentional production of piti, the intentional production of um, this jhana quality euphoria uh, as an entry point to samadhi, as an entry point to jhana itself. Um, there is some risk here in that sometimes we misidentify an ordinary sensation as being PT. Uh, so we just have some ordinary sensation in the body and we think that that's this samadhi born euphoria. Uh, and then we get fixated on an ordinary sensation. So that's not so useful, but it's also not necessarily a problem. Because if your mind is unified around any sensation, then that's samadhi. So even if you latch onto something that's not actually PT, uh, but it's just an ordinary pleasant sensation, if you stabilize your mind around awareness of sensation, well, that's samadhi. That's still doing meditation. That's just another way of doing mindfulness of the body. Uh, so there's not really anything wrong with that. Uh, so that's, again, that's perfectly fine. Um, another element, uh, again, I'll, I'll go into more detail on these, these other factors tomorrow, perhaps. Uh, but a, a couple of the other factors of jhana that is spoken about, particularly in the, particularly in the Anupada Sutta. Uh, so first off, with all four jhanas, there is extremely strong sati. So your mindfulness, your sati is extremely strong. So again, making sure that your present moment awareness is as sharp, precise, and clear as possible. Uh, this also will greatly accelerate progress into samadhi. Uh, quality of, of resolution or determination. Uh, so there needs to be this firm resolve of like, yes, I'm really going to do this. Um, I'm really committed to doing this meditation practice. Uh, that's a very important element uh, of making progress in samadhi, and especially if we're trying to enter into jhana. It's really important to have that, that firm resolution, that really strong commitment uh, to go with it as far as we can, to really dig deeply into it. Um, and if we're having trouble bringing up that strength of resolve, uh, there's a few recollections which sometimes can be helpful. Uh, one is the recollection of death. We're all going to die. We don't know when, we don't know how, but we know for sure it's going to happen. Uh, and if our practice is not well developed, then we will die confused. And we might wind up somewhere very unpleasant. On the other hand, uh, if we develop our practice well, then when we die, we'll continue moving unerringly towards awakening. We'll experience ever-improving conditions until we attain awakening. So that's a way of giving us some sense of, of the urgency and importance of our practice. It's recognizing that right now, my mind is very scattered, untrained, unstable, 
And if I were to die today, it's not sure what direction I'm going from here. It's not sure that I'm pointed fully towards awakening. My mind points in a lot of different directions. One of them is awakening, but there's a lot of other ways it's pointing. So who knows where I'm going to wind up? So that can give us some sense of, of importance to our practice. Like, well, I really need to make a firm resolution to train my mind. Because if I die with my mind in its current untrained state, things could get really bad really quick. And I might lose all the progress that I've made so far. So that recollection of death can help point us in the right direction. Um, another useful thing to recall, uh, so I touched on this a bit yesterday with the, the question about regret over past mistakes. Um, it's important to, rec to recollect that every single one of us has the capacity to become fully enlightened. No exceptions. Some people think uh, that they don't have it in them, but actually every single one of us has exactly the same spark, exactly the same capacity. Uh, so in the Mahayana text they call this Buddha nature, uh, which is the ability that every single person has to become fully enlightened. And it's exactly the same in every person. Nobody has any more or any less Buddha nature than anybody else. Every single person has the ability to attain full enlightenment. No exceptions. Even cats, though, they're usually pretty confused, so I wouldn't count on them becoming Buddhas anytime soon. Um, but humans have a pretty good shot at it. Uh, we've got pretty, pretty ideal conditions for developing the path. So recollecting our own capacity to attain awakening. Uh, and as I spoke about last night, uh, remembering that we are on the same path that every Buddha has walked. We were on the same path that every Arhant has walked. We were on the same path that every Bodhisattva has walked. They've all been through exactly the same things that we're going through now. Um, and they all got through it perfectly fine. And they all got through it through the power of determination, the power of resolution, the power of commitment. So if we bring up that same resolution and determination, then we can get through this and become a bit more Buddha-like. So bringing up that really strong resolution, that determination, that commitment, uh, to really put ourselves wholeheartedly into our practice. Um, and uh, again, even if you go into the hall and you're like, I just can't do it today, it's really not working, maybe I'll just go lie down. Well, recognize that even if it seems like your practice is not going so well, if you just go and sit in that hall, other people will see you and it will give them encouragement. It will give them strength. They'll look around and they'll see, oh, he's sitting here, he's sitting here, she's sitting here, she's sitting here. All these people are sitting here. They're all making an effort, or at least it looks like they are. Um, so since they're all making an effort, I can make an effort too. So just by going and sitting in the hall with the other people, you're giving them strength. You're giving them encouragement. Maybe inside you feel like you're not doing anything useful, but just the mere fact that you're sitting there means you're doing something wonderful, which is helping other people attain awakening. And when you help others on the path, then your own path becomes stronger. When you help others along the way, it gets easier for you as well. This is one of the little secrets in Buddhism, by the way. If you want to attain awakening, help other people. Seems counterintuitive. You'd think that helping yourself is, is the right way. But actually helping other people is helping yourself. And helping yourself is helping others. Um, believe it or not, this is actually from a Theravada Sutta. Um, I quoted this to a Mahayana monk a few years ago, a few months ago actually. Uh, and he said, oh, that is Mahayana. And I'm like, actually it's from the Theravada Suttas. <laughs> um, but that's because Mahayana is already in the Theravada. Uh, it's not something different. It's something which, which comes from the same source. So when we help others, we help ourselves. When we help, others, uh, when we help ourselves, we help others. 
Um, it's completely interconnected, inseparable. Uh, so even if it seems like it's, your practice is going absolutely terrible, just go and sit in the hall anyway. Um, just sit there and think, I am going to fake it just so that the people <laughs> around me have uh, something to uplift them, something to encourage them. And that also is Buddhist practice. Pretending to meditate is actually a good Buddhist practice. It's totally legit. You can do it. So I think that's all I'm going to say this afternoon. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, just a quick um, summary then. Uh, it's okay if there's some noise in your mind as long as you don't react to it. You can intentionally produce physical euphoria as a shortcut to jhana. Um, any method is okay as long as your mind is becoming increasingly stable, bright, and mindful, alert, and peaceful. And four, it's perfectly fine to pretend to meditate as that brings benefit to others as well as to yourself. So I think we'll close it there at this point. Thank you. Um, and at this time, we'll go ahead and meet.